in Melbourne, it's at 10 o'clock, and uh, where okay. Professor Pinar, it's uh, 9 o'clock in the evening, so we've got... Okay, so it's, it's, it's not quite night yet. Not quite. Still a few so, more hours to work, still, before the, uh, before the reaching hour. Yes, of course. Okay. So, we are past uh, our beginning time, so shall we kick off? Yeah. Have a good webinar. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear, dear participants of, of this WPO webinar on sustainable packaging, I wish you all welcome to, to our webinar, which I think is third in, in order. And uh, uh, I would like to say a couple of words uh, in, in the very beginning, uh, stressing the importance of, of sustainability in packaging. That is something that has grown in importance in, in the last years. Uh, all major companies around the world have people responsible for sustainable development in their organizations. In many cases, these people have the sole responsibility of uh, <clears throat> creating some sort of a report on sustainable development in the company in question. But in some companies, uh, the, let's say the duties go further. Personally, I think that uh, sustainability in packaging is, is something very important and packaging can, show, can, can have a big role in sustainable development and in the reaching the sustainability goals of a company. We have uh, some fantastic speakers here among us today and uh, I will introduce them one by one uh, as, as their turn to, to speak uh, is, is uh, approaching. We start with uh, uh, our, our most distinguished uh, speaker today, who is Professor Pierre, Pierre Pienard. Pierre Pienard's interest in packaging started in 1984 after having studied pharmacy. Soon after joining a large pharmaceutical company, Pierre became concerned about the number of packaging related issues in the pharmaceutical world. Pierre went, went on to a Master of Science degree as packaging engineering slash technology from Brunel University in the UK. He also has a Master of Manufacturing and Production degree from University of Hertfordshire, UK. He's registered certified packaging professional CPP. Pierre lectures in the science of packaging to numerous universities across the globe. As a result, he has been conferred with a professorship from two universities. Pierre has over 35 years of experience in the field of pharmaceutical, confectionery, food and beverage packaging, and runs his own packaging consulting business, Pactech Solutions Limited, which includes consulting as an expert witness in legal cases focusing on problems associated with all forms of packaging and the impact of the entire supply chain on the packaging. Pierre is responsible for the education program of the Australian Packaging Australian Institute of Packaging, AIP, and frequently lectures on their behalf in all areas of packaging, design, science, and engineering. As a lecturer or a consultant or an expert witness, Pierre's greatest asset is that he has worked for over three decades with all forms of packaging materials, including glass, board, metals, and plastics, as well as consulting to companies on the best practice in the supply chain. Pierre is currently the president of the World Packaging Organization and is passionate about sustainability and striving for a circular economy. Pierre, the virtual floor is yours. Go ahead, please. Well, thank you very much. Uh, is that coming up on the screen, uh, Antra? It is, yes. If you put on the, the presentation mode. And that's come up in um, PowerPoint mode. Okay. Thank you. Wonderful. A very good day to everyone across the globe. Uh, wonderful to be here with um, my distinguished uh, counterparts, uh, whom Andro will uh, in due course introduce. I want to start off uh, explaining what my understanding is of sustainability and how I see it. And I think that to some extent we see sustainability is slightly different. Every year on the Gold Coast in Australia, they have this 
called Swell. It's for new designers uh, and they can display their, their designs on a particular beach here on the Gold Coast. And this year, a few weeks ago, I came across this particular display. Uh, it's called the Umbrella Effect. And for those of you who know, uh, um, you may well have heard of the Umbrella Effect. But yeah, it takes on a physical interpretation of the eco ecological term Umbrella Effect, because this is giving reference to the imbalance of uh, our environment, climate, and culture. And uh, I'm sure this will come through in the discussion this evening. Mahatma Gandhi said back in the turn of uh, uh, about 1900, he said that there's enough on the planet for everyone's need, but not enough for everyone's greed. And so true is that 120 years later. If one looks at the slide and you see vegetables and fruit across the globe, the advantage is uh, through packaging, uh, I can have bananas out of season in Europe uh, in the middle of winter if I want to. And that's made possible by packaging. What impact is that sort of packaging having on our environment? That coupled with the human population, which today is 7.8 million, and the amount of packaging is direct, has a direct relationship to the population. As the population grows, so there is more packaging required. And is it the correct packaging? And that's where this comes in, into the circular economy and sustainability fits into that ongoing circle of production, consumption and waste. And round and round it goes. Because, and this is so important, this slide, if one looks at this slide and one sees that if we continue on the trajectory that we're currently on, at the rate that we're using our natural resources, then by 2050, we will require just short of three planet Earths. And we're all very aware that there is no such thing. So we have to, we have no alternative but to do something about ensuring that we leave this place in a better place that, in a better situation than what we found it in relation to using our natural resources. Because if all of us, every single one of us across the world does our part in relation to sustainability and using the, the correct material that is recyclable, then we can be put on a different path, the path that leads us back to one earth by 2050. And so it's not just about the use of material making it a higher barrier or lightweighting it, reduction in re and recycling, but also we must not lose sight that we need to empower consumers so that they can lead their lives in a more environmentally, environmentally positive way. And that's where education comes into it, as well as equipping and empowering our next generation. And as you can see here, these are little ones, these are grade ones. And we need to teach them about the correct use of packaging so we can have a better life by 2050. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. Can I ask you a question right away? So you, you said that, that we have to empower uh, the, the consumer and, and the great audience. In addition to education, which is, your, of course, your, your great speciality, uh, what other means can you think of? Well, you know, it, it's in, from an industry perspective, um, you know, I said in my presentation there about the, the consumer's um, being able to learn more and understand more about packaging. But at the same time, those involved from an industry perspective, those that are already in packaging, 
uh, are they doing the, the right thing about using and uh, creating packaging that is able to be recycled over and over and over and over again? And so we get to a point where, um, as I put that slide up regarding the map with the vegetables and the fruit all over the world, this is so, so important because it's quite easy for us, uh, especially the older generation, to say, well, hang on, you know, we, you know, we, we're at the, end of, at the back end of our life um, and, uh, you know, the future generations, let them sort it out. But that's not the way to look at it. We each have an obligation to do something about our own backyard. How many of us are throwing away a lot of food out the fridge every week, every month? How many of us are placing used uh, packaging uh, in recycled bins and just not dumping it all into one bin? And when one looks across the globe into our waterways and our beaches and the sea, one only has to look at the Great Pacific Garbage Patch to get an idea of what man has done to our environment, and that has to change. So yes, it's education, but at the same time, we need the material that is recyclable. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Okay. Well, we'll continue the discussion in the, with, with, with the other speakers just in, in a while. But in the meantime, I'll introduce right. you our, our next speaker, Dr. Johannes Bergmeier, who studied food and biotechnology at the University of Natural Resources and Applied Food Life Sciences in Vienna, that's shortened as BOKU. He complemented his technical master at Institute of Food Technology in the year of 1999. His special field within the range of packaging is the quality assurance within the supply chain food. In this area, apart from numerous publications in magazines, he finished his doctor thesis at Technical University in Vienna in the autumn of 2002. From 2000 to 2016, he was employed at Ofi Packaging Institute in Vienna, where he had the position of an institute leader. In 2017, Johannes founded his own packaging consulting company, Pack Experts. Dr. Bergmeier holds numerous lectures for packaging technology on several Austrian and German universities, works as a court expert for packaging, as an auditor for hygiene management. Dr. Bergmeier is also a member of the Austrian Standardization Committee Packaging and the Austrian board member of WPO, World Packaging Organization, since 2011, where he also held the function of WPO's Vice President for Sustainability and Food Safety. And since the 1st of January 2018, he is the General Secretary of WPO. Johannes, the virtual floor is yours now. Please go ahead. Thank you, Antro. Hearing all this, I get the idea that I may be already too old a little bit. <laughs> but not feeling like this. Yeah. 20 years in packaging and, and still, still interesting and still many things to discuss. You, you, Johannes, you are not old, you are experienced. Experience. Okay, thank you so much, Antro. Pia, thank you for your for your thoughts. Really interesting, and I'm happy to discuss this because my input would be there. It's then also about packaging design, or it must empower us as consumers, and we are all also consumers on packaging, yeah, to to live more environmental friendly, and it should be natural, yeah, to use packaging in in environmental way. Yeah, so many things to discuss. But first, let me give my my input. Also, three, four, five slides on this, yeah, because if somebody already heard me talking about this, there is one big issue, and Pierre also already mentioned it. It's about that saving food issue. Yeah, this is our slogan. You have seen it already at, in in Pierre's presentation. Yeah, better quality of life through better packaging for more people. This is what we are really, uh, really convinced. Yeah, that packaging is is as many people think packaging is the is the problem if we talk about uh, environmental. Uh, problems we have nowadays on earth and, and, and uh, Pierre has mentioned it already if you think about the garbage uh, in the in the 
uh, Pacific Ocean is this is this is just tremendous, and we have to to work on this, and we have to change, and we have to end this. Yeah? And also the the issue with the two three Earths we are using meanwhile, or in some years we have to change this. And many people think if we would avoid packaging, then this would be the solution. And we at WPO and me personally, I say no, that's the wrong way, uh, because packaging is part of the solution, not part of the problem. Why is it like this? If you have ever heard a presentation on me talking on environmental issues about packaging, I always show this picture. Yeah? What are we seeing here? I hope uh, you see my, 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 my arrow here. We have down here the increasing packaging material on the x-axis yeah? and on the y-axis it's the negative environmental impact. Yeah? Whatever this is nowadays, normally CO2 balance or energy use, material use, uh, maybe use of some limited resources, uh, something like this. Yeah? And if you follow the orange line here, the yellow orange line, you see that for sure, like many people think, if we are reducing packaging, we can reduce the environmental impact. For sure this is true, because using less material means we need less energy and we have less pollution because we have less waste. But if you think that this line goes down to zero here somewhere, ending up with the idea no packaging would be the best solution, then you will suddenly recognize, no, that's not true. Because this line, there's a point of no return yeah, where it goes up again. Yeah? That means below this point, if we are reducing packaging, if we have something that we call under packaging, we have higher environmental impact, negative impact. Why is it like this? Because the biggest mistake you can make in talking about packaging and environment that you only talk about packaging. We have to realize, and maybe this is the first step of education we have to do, packaging comes always in line with our feeling good. Is it foodstuff? Is it a pharmaceutical? Is it a technical pro pro uh, product? Is it some uh, pro product for, for construction work? Uh, uh, like sand, such easy things like sand. And for all these materials is true, if we have not enough packaging and packaging cannot give the protection function, which is the most important function of packaging, then we lose the product. And for sure this product is also coming with negative environmental impact. And this negative environmental impact is, is, is realized in a minute if packaging is not working correctly. And this is, I think, what we, beside recycling and so on, should also talk about, not forget about it. There were some, some uh, colleagues of mine listing this, how can, we, how can we judge it? For sure, we need optimized material production and as less material as possible for packaging. And for sure, we should talk about recovery, optimal recovery and optimal recycling of our packaging materials. Yeah? But the most important thing, because it has the highest impact, is the high functionality, quality, and benefit out of a packaging. Because if you're losing this, then packaging is really only waste. Yeah? But if we have good packaging, it protects goods, and so we can save and environment. And they even say, yes, it's, it's that, that list. First of all, high functionality, like barrier and such things, and then minimal of use, and then recycling. What is WPO doing on this? We are working on, on, on such projects, yeah, like uh, the Safe Food Initiative uh, by Interpark and FAO and many other associations. We are part of it. And we do things like this. Easy packaging. Plastic bags for corn in Africa are saving 30 to 40% of foodstuff. Yeah? And this is what packaging is doing. And we at WPO try to highlight things, such things, try to do education on such things, that they are reused correctly and that they are reused correctly and that they are recycled correctly. And what we also doing, this is maybe breaking news also for some of, of our group within WPO. Yeah? Uh, we are working on circular packaging design guidelines. Yeah? But because this, this circular economy thing is, is there and it's very important, very important discussion. And we will do our contribution as WPO based on, on local regional guidelines we have already. As an example here in Austria, my colleagues at the university did it, that, that, that study you see here in the picture. Yeah? And these are also some, 
some impressions out of that out of that study where we can say okay how can we design a PET bottle to make it easy to recycle or even possible to recycle how can we design a tube for toothpaste or whatever to make it recyclable and for sure this depends also where this tube gets on the market because recycling in Europe is different from recycling in Australia different from recycling in, in Southeast Asia and this is what we are doing at the moment in WPO discussing about this recycling streams and how can we define to make packaging more recycling more, more recyclable as an example just yesterday, Pierre and me had again a, a meeting with, with Indonesian colleagues. Yeah, there we are working very detailed on, on in improving the recycling system in Indonesia and improving the recyclability of, of packaging materials. So this is my message. Yes, recycling is the big thing we are doing at the moment, but don't forget about the protection function. Don't forget that packaging is not only about recyclability, it's also about protecting our building. Thank you so much. Oh, stop sharing. Okay, thank you, Johannes. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Well, you were talking about uh, this this uh, narrow line where where overpackaging can turn into into underpackaging. Mm -hmm. um, how much do you think uh, there really exists overpackaging on the market? Because overpackaging is, is from time to time always, you know, a hot topic, you know, there, there are people like policymakers or, or some other environmentalists who say that, ah, oh, overpackaging is the biggest headache of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, but how much would you estimate there is overpackaging? Not easy to give a, 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 a concrete figure now, yeah, kind of this, but I don't Not think that figure, this problem big, is... Big, big fingertip figure. Yeah, fingertip it about maybe some 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 percent there, yeah, but small amount, one, two percent kind of this, yeah. Because I think we have it sometimes in areas where packaging has to be really beautiful, yeah. If it's some present, some beautiful chocolate, uh, then but even there you can discuss well. I always say, okay, I could also sit naked here. Yeah, would also work. Yeah? I have a heating system in my house, <laughs> would work, but it's a good habit that I have some clothes on. It's a kind of packaging, I guess. Yeah, And so I think we should also do this with, with chocolate. Why is it like this? Why, why I don't think there is so much overpacking? Because packaging is money. Yeah, And no company is using more packaging material that he really can afford. Yeah? And, Packaging costs are one of the first to reduce because it's not related directly with the product. Yeah, so I think that that yes, there are some cases and we can discuss this, but this is not our big problem, for no. sure. No. I, I very much agree with you because yeah. my my personal point of view uh, and and uh, the argument I have been using very often is that market economy takes care of of over packaging. Yeah, somebody who would be overspending for packaging they, they are weakening their own profitability and they are losing yeah. on the market and and that means that actually it's yeah. it's, it's a stupid thing to do yeah. Yeah. there's also one interesting fact i guess if we are really working now a lot on on recyclability of packaging materials in my eyes we will end up with a more of packaging material out of this discussion yeah because all this this very thin line, reduced, flexible packaging, they are not so good in recyclability, yeah? So we go back again, let's say, from a, from a stand-up pouch to, to a glass bottle. And for sure, this means 10 times, 100 times more packaging material per unit we pack, yeah? But it's then better recyclable. And yeah, we can discuss this and, and see what is better in, in the environmental balance, yeah? But we should uh, see this, yeah, that, that this is maybe one consequence of this discussion. Absolutely. Well, we, we will come back to that after, yeah, after sure, yeah. uh, listening to, to Joe's presentation. Because our third speaker today or tonight, whatever your, your uh, local uh, clock shows, or in the morning, is, is Joe Foster. He's, he's uh, our last speaker, but not least of, of the speakers, by all means. Joe, as managing director and co-founder of OF Packaging, Joe Foster has spent his, the majority of his life working not only understanding flexible packaging at its core, but progress the possibilities of flexible packaging with a continued focus on packaging innovation. 
Joe decided to begin his own company in 1998, starting Poster Packaging in South Africa, which con continues to supply packaging to clients today, and former offices in Ireland and in the UK. Since moving to Australia in 2010, Joe helped form OF Packaging as a fundamentally customer-focused business, driven by new concepts and developments in addition to servicing the everyday packaging and processing needs of clients. Joe is a fellow of the Australian Institute of Packaging and very active within the organization, helping train and educate others on the latest in flexible packaging and sustainability. He was grateful to win the PETA Packaging Professional of the Year in 2019 and the World Star Packaging Lifetime Achievement Award in 2020, highlighting his great contributions to the local packaging industry. Joe, the virtual floor is yours. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Andrew. And uh, of course, thank you to the uh, World Packaging Organization. So I'll just go ahead and share my, my screen. I just want to confirm that it's, um, it's up on the screen now, if that's okay. Yes, thank you. Great. So I suppose this first statement really is a statement that all packaging companies would like to own. But in terms of packaging policies from an environmental perspective, we see it as that all packaging suppliers, we all need to embrace our role in reducing food and material waste to landfill by improving our carbon footprint and working towards real viable packaging solutions for our customers without misinformation, or as we call it, greenwashing. And you know, each packaging company can actually claim ownership for that statement. But in reality, as the packaging industry, companies from all over the world, whether it's Australia or whether it's New, uh, New Zealand or UK or America or Europe, we all need to embrace that we need to make some changes with regards to sustainability policies. And of course, it's already been mentioned uh, twice from Professor Pinar and also from uh, Johannes, is also trying to reduce food waste. And we know packaging plays a very, very important role in uh, keeping food away from landfill. So in terms of sustainability research and developments, there's many different offerings on the go at the moment. We look at various recyclable and compostable film offerings. We look at pouching and rewinds uh, made from recycled plastics, which of course is a challenge for food packaging. We look at packaging weight reduction. And of course, it was just mentioned in the last discussion on, on a very, very good question because you know, the question is about how much packaging is over-engineered. In a lot of cases, uh, it's, it's over-engineered, uh, very region specific. We look at solvent reduction laminations. And of course, again, mentioned by Professor Pienaar, education and training, which I think is quite important because in the space that we operate within the packaging industry and certainly within the flexible packaging industry, which is seen perhaps as soft plastics, which in my opinion is a bit of a debatable issue because flexible packaging is that little bit more complicated than your general soft plastics uh, is very, very confused. And certainly looking at it from a, from a recyclable perspective, there's still a lot of questions that needs to be answered. So what we say here is that, first of all, we cannot lose fact or lose face, which is really, really important, is the packaging requirement hierarchy. It's all very well saying, you know, uh, we want to move into a sustainability uh, solution or look at sustainability options, but very, very important, as already been mentioned, is product protection. Product protection and product safety is quite important. We want the packaging to run efficiently on our machines. Of course, we're all looking for zero waste which is quite important. Again, it's a big ask. Again, pricing comes into it from a commercialization point of view. We're always looking for the cheapest form of packaging. And as you mentioned, uh, Antro, is that of course, it'll come down to commercialization when packaging is being over-engineered. Shelf life is a very important factor. And of course, shelf appeal. We want to sell our product. And how do we sell our product? It's by effectively communicating this information to the market. We want the consumers to go and buy our products. And how do we do that? By effectively using the right type of packaging and communicating it. What about added functionality? Of course, added functionality is quite important because what else can the packaging do? Because sadly, people see packaging as just a container for the product, whether it's to keep it fresh, to extend its life, or just basically take the product from the supermarket to the home and then end up in the trash can. And again, at the bottom, we look at sustainability. Uh, at the bottom of the packaging requirement hierarchy. And of course, that's looking at it from a, a supply chain perspective. People question me, say, Joe, why are we looking at sustainability at the bottom of the packaging requirement hierarchy? But what I say really is that let's move it up and let's look at the options of moving it up in terms of importance 
And when we consider moving the sustainability up the ladder of the packaging requirement hierarchy, there is definitely some sort of trade-off. There's no easy solution when it comes to flexible packaging. Changing from one format to a more sustainable option doesn't mean that you can swap uh, your packaging specifications straight away without having to do some sort of adjustment, whether it's a commercial adjustment, whether it's machine efficiency adjustment, or whether it's a zero waste uh, perspective that we need to take into consideration. If we start looking, thinking about flexible packaging, I mean, where we've come from in the past, cellophane and paper, up until the, the 40s and 50s, most food products were being packed in cellophane or paper or waxite, as we all, all knew it. And of course, that was okay, because the shelf life of, of product and food freshness was only required for maybe a month or two months at the, at the maximum, and you normally got it from films like cellophane. But as we know, most flexible packaging has got layers. So a great example is a pouch, a three-side a, a three sealed pouch, or as we call it, a standard pouch, could be made up of four different layers of plastic. And that is really the big challenge from a recyclability point of view, is how do we recycle these complex layers? These complex layers could be layers of polyethylene, nylons, polypropylenes, aluminiums, and, and so forth, which make it very difficult from a separation point of view when we look at recyclability. We look at simple structures, even like a nylon, for instance, polyamide and a polyethylene. For a lot of films that we use within the food industry, again, it's there to protect the product and give the product a shelf life, but very difficult from a recyclability point of view. The great question, of course, has always been asked, well, why can't we just use one single mono layer plastic film to do everything? But of course, we're not talking about the past. We're not talking about the 40s or the 1950s, whereas we're looking at long shelf lives. We're looking at some of our products that last for maybe more than two years or perhaps three years, four years, depending on what the product is. We want products to travel, as Professor Pienaar has said, from, from different parts of the world to arrive in the UK or to arrive in Australia. And of course, we want to ensure our products remain fresh. And very importantly, we want to ensure our products are safe. When the consumer eats the products and consumes the product, we want to make sure that the product tastes exactly the way it's been designed to taste from the moment the product has been produced. So yes, flexible packaging plays a very important role to ensure the safety of these individual food products. Multi-layer laminates, of course, in pouches or whether it's reels, ensure by developing the different layers of laminated constructions, actually tailor make an overall finished substrate to give you the best performance on machinability from a commercialized point of view, of course, pricing, and of course, shelf life and protection and transportation. We take all of those factors into consideration. So if you look at, at the sustainability hierarchy for packaging, of course, very important looking at packaging avoidance. And I could give you many, many examples of where packaging avoidance is a big issue in many parts of the world. Down gauging of packaging weights. A great example of that, however, one looks at frozen foods. And within the frozen food industry, if you look at packaging for frozen vegetables, as a great example, you know, back in the, in the, in the uh, late um, 70s and 80s, when I was involved in the packaging industry, packaging for frozen vegetables were in and around 75 to 80 microns of thickness. We see microns now of 35 and 40 microns of thickness doing the same product. And of course, given the same shelf life, and of course being very engineered to ensure that it's giving you the same result. Using recycled material, of course, within the food industry is a big challenge for, in, uh, for direct food contact using recyclable materials, of course, and that is the, the challenge that we're all faced with. How can we take uh, packaging materials and certainly flexible packaging films and make it more recyclable friendly, not complex in terms of recycling, simple structures that will give you the packaging performance, ensure the food safety, and of course, ensure that your product has a shelf life that is required. And then we've got bio-based compostable materials, which is obviously another opportunity, but again, uh, that comes with a lot of challenges. And of course, before it goes to landfill, we should be saying in terms of the hierarchy for sustainability, is what else could we do to avoid this plastic or this plastic type of packaging material going into landfill is to consider second life energy. And of course, second life energy could be done through pyrolysis, which is really a great opportunity to use the waste plastic and turn it back into crude oil uh, instead of it actually going to, to landfill. So really that's just a, a bit of a broad outline on where I see um, the flexible packaging side of things. And really at the end of the day, it's people say to me, Joe, uh, why aren't we doing more about uh, recyclability? Well, certainly there's a lot of challenges that we have and, I, and it's not a simple switch from one, from one structure to the next. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe.
a very interesting point of view raised there. Uh, we, we have one question from, from the audience. Uh, actually, it's, it's Mohamed Basim Mansouri, uh, who, is, who is asking this, this question, and I, I think that you, you, you might be the right person to, to answer it. So he is, he, he's asking about the, the green claims. The, uh, I read his, his question here. What is required to claim by mono material packaging as recyclable in design pack claims? And what are the best allowed packaging claims to communicate with customers as sustainable or environmentally friendly claims? That's a great question. And uh, I think maybe very difficult to give it a straight answer because different countries have got different claims and, uh, and different options and different abilities to do recyclability. So in terms of mono based materials, as an example, in, in Australia, uh, over here, we don't have currently at this moment in time an ability to do curbside recycling, which going into your into your waste bin uh, for for flexible packaging materials or soft pl soft plastic materials. So the claim that one would make on the packaging in, in Australia would be either landfill claim or the claim would be an option that we have over here, which is return to store, which is through what we call red cycle, which allows the ability for the consumer to take the packaging, uh, clean the packaging, and then return it to their store, providing it meets certain criteria that has been set out by the Australasian Packaging uh, Organization, APCO, Australian Packaging uh, uh, Organization. Okay, I, I, I do agree very much with, with your, your logics. Okay, now after having, having heard all the presentations, uh, well, let's, let's, let's start the panel discussion and, and uh, We'll kick off with uh, some questions from the audience. Um, just a second, I'll be able to, to uh, answer them. First of all, uh, there, there's uh, a question. Wait a second, I'm getting here a little bit lost. Um, yeah, a question about overpackaging, something we discussed already with, with, with Johannes a little bit. Um, uh, here's, here's a question Doesn't overpackaging pose a major problem in the premium products industry? where consumers are concerned with products outlook and are ready to pay much more for fancier products, mostly in beauty and personal care and similar industries. So um, more or less a luxury product. So uh, uh, who would like to start? We, we can go in, 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 in full rounds, but somebody has to start. Yeah, I, I can start because I typed already that, that, that written answer yeah. there. Yeah, uh, Because, yes, I'm, I'm totally with you, Matthias, uh, that this is, if we have a problem with overpacking, then it's mostly in that sector of luxury packaging. Yeah? I think I tried to mention this before. Yeah, And for sure, this is something we, we can discuss and we should discuss. And we should really go for every pack and see, is there, some, is there a possibility to reduce? Yeah? But on the other hand side, what we don't, should forget is that packaging in that luxury sector has also that 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 um, the job to 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 show this luxury effect. Yeah? Uh, if you want to buy a luxury thing, you it must look luxury. Yeah, and this is means packaging must look luxury. Yeah. And for sure, we can discuss how can we achieve this with as less packaging as possible. Yeah. But at the end, we need something there. And there is another question in there, yeah, uh, the shelf appearance thing, yeah. For sure, packaging in my eyes is is a is a factor of our of our economic driven world, yeah. Uh, and I think it's not to blame packaging that we say, okay, everything should be beautiful and we should sell as much as possible, and we have this communication marketing function in packaging there. Uh, if we discuss this, we have to discuss our whole economic system and we have to change our, our complete economic system of, of, of market, uh, of buying things on the market. I hope it is clear what I'm saying. And that. Uh, yeah, help me. Honest, I think that to a large extent, the consumers, uh, we are to blame by creating this, uh, situation around packaging and, and, and putting it on a pedestal. Um, you know, if one looks uh, back at our grandparents, maybe, maybe our great grandparents, it's a very different scenario. And I'll come back to that, um, this 
how we've imposed this uh, artificial uh, scenario of uh, uplifting the, the product through packaging. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I think in certain cases, um, it, it's recognized probably more so in the cosmetic industry, in the perfumes, um, than say um, in, in, in household products maybe. But at the same time, uh, that wasn't the case with our grandparents. Even if we take the product, for example, uh, and, and this is probably more predominant in some countries than others, but if one sees a bent or a skew carrot, we tend not to take it. We take the straight one. Yet the carrot tastes the same. If the mate means tin, it has a little dent in it. We don't take that one. Now, I know that some people will say, well, hang on now, you know, if it's a dent, it could affect the uh, internal um, uh, lacquer. Um, but that's why I have a fair dent to do that. But any little um, scar of any nature on the packaging, we don't take it. And so we create, a, 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 you know, really a, a scenario where we to blame for what the outcome is now, we, and, and what we're facing into the future, it might get only worse. And maybe from a food packaging point of view, if I may use an example, uh, something that I'm currently working on and something that I experienced um, over the last couple of years is for snack food packaging, a great example. You know, I used um, the example of cellophane uh, and paper earlier on in the 40s and 50s, and, and potato crisps is a great example. Uh, in the 70s and certainly in the 80s, we were very used to eating packets of potato crisps. And, and we didn't realize we actually got used to the taste of potato crisps that were semi-stale, okay, because the shelf life was relatively short. But then all of a sudden, when we introduced metallized substrates, which actually gave longer shelf life, we were able to keep the, the chips a lot fresher. But just adding on to that, um, so therefore it enhanced the appeal, it enhanced the image of, of the packaging. One can question whether that was being overpackaged or not, but in fact, it protected the product even more. When I compare packaging in Australia and Europe compared to uh, packaging in Asia, great example, the Philippines recently I was there, China, also for snack food packaging. Where we would use packaging in, in Australia is a good example. Of anything between 45 microns and 60 microns for, uh, let's call it a 200 gram packets of, crisp, uh, of crisps, crisps or, or snack food, that same product in the Philippines or in China would probably be about 90 microns or 100 microns. So that in itself, we're nearly using sort of practically double the amount of packaging. We see that certainly in, in China where you have individual sweets being packed in a tray, that tray then being packed in a flow wrap and that flow wrap then is being packed in a multi-pack. So you've actually got four or five different types of packaging, con uh, packaging concepts in a, in, a, in a sense going into one big outer bag. And of course, the amount and, and of course the individual packaging that's being used is, is not thin packaging, it's quite heavy packaging. So when I questioned the, um, the, 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 the client in the Philippines when we talked about the snack food packaging, why are we using such a heavy specification uh, compared to what we'd use in Australia? Well, then it's deemed by the consumer as being high quality. Uh, it's very, because it, it actually feels different. Okay, it feels that we're getting a high quality product. When I showed them the, South Af the Australian product and certainly some South African products that we showed, they said this wouldn't actually wouldn't go down too well with, with the consumer because it feels too thin. We're trying to cheapen the product and then lessen the quality of what that product image is going to be. It's quite interesting from a consumer perspective. One of our snack food clients in, in Australia is going through the process of down gauging, uh, which is very, impart, very much part of their plan for sustainability. And we're doing all the trials and so forth. And the big warning is that, hey, we need to make sure the consumer acceptance is, is, is fine. Uh, but yet, the message we're putting out there in terms of down gauging, we're saying, okay, we've actually removed 20 microns of polyethylene from 100 microns overall thickness, and therefore we're saving so much plastic. So that message, that call out message is actually being put onto the packaging. So the consumer feels that the packaging is thinner, but yet they know that we're actually taking away a, a percentage of packaging that's being used, which is very good. So while, we're, we're, while we want to down gauge, I think the message should be put out to the consumer so they understand that the reason why we're doing it is we're actually reducing the the amount of plastic that's been being used. But yeah. 
Joe, that, yeah. that means again, we are on, on the communication thing, or this is Pierre's yes. argument at the very beginning. We have yep. to talk about these issues. We have to tell the consumer uh, these, these things and we have to empower consumers that they understand what's going on and what packaging yep. is and, and what is high quality and what is not high quality. Yeah? It's not always thickness. <laughs> it's maybe uh, other tasks in there. Yeah. And just to maybe finish that comment off, like when we have chip packets or, or snack food packets in Australia, I'm sure it's the same in Europe. When you open a packet of crisp, they open nice and easy, correct? They peel mm. open, it's very easy to yeah. open. In Asia, that will not be accepted because yeah. the yeah. packaging is deemed to be inferior yeah. because the pack opens too easily. So what they do is they put it into a bulletproof packaging that you either need a scissors or you got to physically tear it hard to, to physically open the packet. And, and again, communication. A lot of people don't actually know how to open packaging, right? So very simple yeah. thing, even though the instruction is there. But yeah, so from a, from a perspective where the packaging is supplied in Asia, they would say, no, this is not, this is not, this is not good quality. It's actually open too easy. It's, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Different strokes really, for different regions, really. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah that's, that's, that, that's, that's absolutely true. Then, then again, I think that we, we have to always remember that, that one of, of packaging roles is, is to build the, the brand. And, and uh, when you are building a luxury brand, you have to have a, a luxury packaging for that, just like, like Johannes said. But then again, these things can, can change quite rapidly. Uh, also, when, when, when the, the customers or, or large amounts of, or volumes of customers decide that, that something that used to be luxurious is, is not luxurious anymore, but it's actually wasting resources, it can turn the, the, the tide very quickly. And uh, I think that there, there we come back to, to Pierre's favorite topic, which is education. And, and education is, is key element in, in all these things. So we have to educate people to understand what is really necessary and what is not. But let's, let's move to the next topic. Uh, I think Johannes already answered this one, but, but I think that it's such a, such a great question coming from the audience that uh, I would like to have the comments from, from everybody. Uh, so, so here's a question from Matthias Holder. Uh, what does WPO do to do also? Uh, what does WPO do to also show politics that packaging cannot be completely abolished? Uh, they typically have not the knowledge to to differentiate. So, in other words, uh, he, he's he's uh, uh, doubting the, the knowledge and know-how of our politics and politicians and policymakers. How how can WPO influence? The public opinion or the opinion of, of the policymakers, and here I would like to have uh, Pierre's Pierre's point of view uh, first, please. Yeah, thank you very much for that question, uh, and, and it is um, a very apt and very pertinent, and it certainly does need some some debate. Again, I say that uh, various countries uh, look at packaging very differently. Um, let me also say from the, from the outset that the WPO uh, has aligned themselves and works very closely with a number of global organizations, global institutions. Uh, and the feeling amongst those groups uh, certainly is a, 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 very, a very good level of understanding. When one comes to the governments within countries, that's very debatable because it depends on whether or not there's an election coming up in that country. And we understand the politicians. However, having said that as well, uh, each one of the, um, the executive committee in their own way uh, is liaising with governments in their region, certainly in their own countries. Um, and to a large extent, those governments understand the position of packaging. Uh, very recently, uh, in some of my travels um, in various countries, talking to their um, trade ministers uh, and minister of uh, industry, uh, it becomes a little bit of a complex problem in trying to change the status quo in a, in, in a very short period of time, because that's what the public wants to see. At the same time, we, we've got to acknowledge certain countries in Europe, and I know that uh, Johannes, I'm sure Johannes will talk about this uh, in his own country. So I'll leave that particular country to Johannes. But there are certainly countries in Europe who are taking uh, very decisive steps and measures to, uh, to uh, 
click back against uh, incorrect use of packaging. In other words, ensure that the packaging is recyclable and having a zero uh, uh, to landfall waste program, which is very encouraging. At the same time, um, we as an WPO uh, have an obligation. Uh, we, we have the knowledge, we have the know-how, we have um, the influence in many countries. Uh, and just to name one or two, right at this moment, uh, Johannes and I spend every Tuesday evening with Indonesia uh, in trying to implement a system. And I must say that the wheels are slowly starting to turn in the right direction in creating a, uh, well, certainly working with uh, um, stakeholders in that country, and that's very important, and working towards reducing plastic, uh, well, plastic waste pollution, and supporting the development of a certain economy. Uh, now, there, we, we are working very closely with brand owners because the success that was established with brand owners in Europe was very successful. And we, we're using that same model in a developing country. So we're taking a developed country's model and implementing it in a developing country's mod, um, uh, scenario. And the results are looking extremely positive. And when, once this is up and running, our intention is to, um, to cascade this out into a number of other developing countries. Where, if, if the governments are not on board with us, that's okay. We know that the, the people will be right across the world. No one, no one wants to see their countryside in a state of pollution. And so one works on that aspect and targeting the, the people in the street uh, and influencing them about creating a circular economy by showing them what is really possible within their own country. Johannes, I'm sure you want some comment and, and I'd like you to comment on, on, uh, on, your own, on your own country and how successful they've been because that's a very yeah. good model. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you, Pierre. Not that much to, to add there. Yeah, I think maybe especially for people outside WPO, you have to understand how we are working. Yeah? Uh, we are not a very big centralized organization. Our strength is that we have our network worldwide. Yeah? So that means we are working and, and this makes especially in that type of discussion, environmental issues and packaging make sense because legislation is not done on a worldwide level. It's done on a, on a local national level. Yeah? On their own countries, maybe in Europe on the European level, yeah? but in all the other areas, it's mainly done on the national government levels. So if we want to influence this, we have to work on this national level. Yeah? And this is what we are doing. We, we as WPO, hopefully empowering our national members because WPO is the organization of the national packaging association institutes, coordinating them, empowering them to have the the work done locally because there it is done and there we have to, to, to influence it. But on the other hand side, WPO is also not, is definitely not a typical lobbying organization. Uh, our budget is much too small for this. And also to be true, I'm happy not to be a, a, a only political lobbying marketing organization. We are more the hands-on guys and working on the technical solutions. And this is, for example, beside our educational programs, Pierre mentioned already, we have our World Star program since more than 50 years running meanwhile. Yeah? And that means every year we are highlighting the best packaging worldwide. And not only in case of marketing and functionality, but also in sustainability. Yeah? And again, this is just the top of the heap, what we're doing worldwide, because if we're doing that, that world of our world for sustainable packaging or for packaging that saves food, that means that preliminary to this award, all the national countries are doing the same in their national uh, awards. Yeah? And that means this way we have these international programs, we spread this idea in working on these issues worldwide. And I can remember, especially because it was a little bit my baby, the, the World Star Award for Packaging That Saves Food. We launched it six years ago, seven years ago, kind of this. Yeah? And I just can remember Australia, yeah, because 
when we discussed it in, the first, in our working group with the first time, they said, yeah, okay, packaging and safe is good. Uh, if you say, we will think about it and we will meet in half a year and then, then let's see what's going on. And the Australian guys really in that half year, they discussed it and they found out, oh, that's exactly what we need at the moment. And they are totally fond of and there are really good solutions coming from, from Australia and good projects running there now on packaging that saves food. And this is, this, these are such success stories then that, that makes me hope that we, we are doing really good work on, on WPO. Joe. Would, would you like to, to uh, give advice to, to uh, WPO? Yeah. Well, uh, I think um, maybe sort of, okay, I think the w, WPO are doing a great job lobbying the various governments around the world. But I mean, from a, a packaging supplier perspective, I think it's also the duty of the packaging industry in the various countries mm -hmm. to also engage with government, to let them understand from a packaging sub supplier's point of view, what is actually going on at grassroots level. I do know that the, the various packaging organizations and certainly the WPO are doing a great job to get that message across to the various different government agencies. But the, 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 the people who are involved in a day-to-day hands-on perspective need to work with governments to let them understand the, the technicalities of the changes that actually need to, need to take place. You got governments around the world making these decisions, you know, taking plastic out of the mainstream by 2025, no plastics, the landfill and so forth. What does, what does that actually mean? You know, taking plastic out of the mainstream, zero plastic, the landfill, you know, there's plastic in packaging. Packaging is only one aspect of where plastic is actually being used. We've got many different aspects of society where that plastic is being consumed. You know, the televisions, the cars that we drive, the medical industry and so forth. You can't survive without, without plastics. That, there's no doubt about it. And I think governments sometimes make that decision about making a change, sometimes a radical change. Some countries in Africa, as a great example, have banned plastics without realizing the consequences of, of their actions. You know, and it, and it, and it becomes a, an illegal black market product in certain countries in Africa. It's, it's, quite, it's quite ironic. But again, what I want to say is, is really, it, I suppose it gets back to an education perspective, because I think really that is the key. It keeps coming up, the communication and educating, letting people know about the real aspects, the real challenges that we are faced with regards to going into a more sustainable option. It's not an easy answer. It's not an easy solution. It cannot happen overnight, but it has to happen with everybody together. There's no race. I think uh, Professor Pina and I have spoken about this before. There's no big race to the top, but who's going to be the first to come up with this great solution in terms of, of a sustainability option that ticks every single, every single box. What we do as a packaging industry, we have to share that. In, we have to share that information. We have to help each other out. I'm trying a, a final note on that question is the last slide in my presentation was of the grade one class. That's where we need to start. Correct. Absolutely. Couldn't couldn't agree with you more. And one but additional. We, <laughs> please, please, please go ahead, Johannes. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, also maybe what I forgot, because if you're talking about, let's say, Australia or Austria or UK or US, I know there are strong packaging institutes and they are doing a great, or Brazil or Lebanon or whatever, or Finland, yeah. <laughs> there are great packaging institutes there. And I know, and it's a different way of, of working there as WPO than in other countries, because one big issue is also in countries where we don't have these packaging structures, we try to implement them. This is also a big program we have, joined somehow sometimes with UNIDO, United uh, Nations Industrial Development Organization, going to countries and trying to set up packaging structures, however we call it, packaging institutes, packaging associations there, incorporate or connect them with WPO to facilitate that international exchange. Yeah? This is also what we're doing. Examples, Jordan, uh, a packaging institute was founded there uh, three, four years ago and is very active, not only in Jordan, but in that region. Yeah? And hopefully Egypt will follow and maybe Oman will follow and Morocco will follow and so on. Or we're talking with Mongolia or Vietnam, setting up packaging institutes there because this is, I think, the, the very important point also to have these structures locally, to understand the local market and the local packaging needs uh, towards sustainability for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so that, that was really a, a, a global high-flying question, the, the previous one, but let's, let's, let's go back to uh, a more detailed one coming from the audience. 
um, and the question is, is, is following, isn't placing the shelf ap uh, appeal higher in the pyramid uh, an approval to consumerism instead of the actual service that the product offers? And I think this is coming from, from Joe's presentation. So Joe, could you start answering? So the, the question is um, the importance of shelf appeal being higher up where it mm -hmm. should be or down. Is, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think, again, I mean, the example that was used uh, in cosmetic packaging as a great example, the shelf appeal and, and the, 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 the consumer engagement with the product is a very important role in terms of wanting the, the manufacturer of the product to sell their to sell their product. It's going to change. I do honestly believe from uh, from region to region and certainly from product type to product type. There's no doubt about it. The packaging hierarchy, that's the way I see it is that this, the supply chain, it designs the packaging hierarchy from where it starts right down to right down to the bottom. And again, the importance is going to move from each product. I, I do see that. But shelf we all want to sell products, right? There's no doubt about it. That's the reason why we're in business. Okay. Any food manufacturing company is going to be doing their very best to angle in the marketplace to get their product in over supplier B or supplier B, uh, C. And what is their point of differentiation? Okay. If we have all the same type of packaging selling the same type of product, what, what is, what is the, the reason why the consumer is going to buy this product? Is it going to be purely on price or is it going to be on perceived quality? And how does one actually perceive quality is by looking to try and add some sort of value to the packaging itself by enhancing its appearance, it's enhancing its, its shelf appeal. So yes, I do believe that is quite important in the packaging hierarchy because of course, why would you put your product into packaging? Why would you put your product into plain packaging when the choices out there are so vast for the consumer? You want, to, you want your packaging to jump off the shelf. How does it jump off the shelf? Is by saying, buy me because the consumer is only going to look at it for the first time for literally 10 seconds, if they have 10 seconds to spare and say, I like this, I'll have a read it, and I'll take it home and I'll try it. I hope that's answered the question in the, in the right way. Absolutely. Great Thanks. answer. Thank you, Joe. Uh, would you like to add something, Pierre or Johannes, in, in whichever uh, order? I think Joe's answered it uh, oh, well. Perfect. You know, yeah. Perfect. 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 Well, exceptionally um, well. Yeah. Apple has done uh, exactly what Joe is saying. Uh, they've upmarketed their product uh, exceptionally well, and I and I and I and I mentioned that cosmetic thing over and over uh, in, in a lot of um, in a class environment. It, uh, you know, would would a lady accept uh, her perfume in a plain bottle? You know, we've got uh, Mrs. Atala there and Mrs. Benegrino there. You know, they'd love to answer this question. Would they accept their favourite um, um, fragrance in a in a very plain, ordinary bottle? No, yeah, we would like to have a fancy bottle and beautiful one, shaped and colourful, and so on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think Pierre has mentioned the Apple experience, and that yeah. box, that Apple box, that has been designed. That took a long time to design that that box because that box. And the outer wrapping, the shrink wrap has been chosen very, very specifically for that type of box. The carton itself is creates a vacuum. It's all about the engagement with the consumer. You get your iPad, you get your iPhone or whatever device you do get from Apple. And, and the experience of opening this, this packet to get, to get into what you really want is the actual iPhone or whatever the pad is. But it's, it's a great in consumer engagement. And that's really what the packaging is doing. It's giving that engagement It's part of the buying process. It's a part of the, let's call it the enjoyment process of making that decision in terms of the purchasing that you've just made. Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> and if you want to see more of these experiences, go to YouTube and, and search with the keyword unboxing. Yes. And, 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 and you'll find millions of, of video clips nowadays. Yeah. Okay. Right, let's, let's go from, from detail back to a uh, more, more global question. Here, here's a question from Pratamesh Patil from the audience. Has sustainability in packaging taken a backseat in this COVID era? Well, so I have an actual well, so, story on this. Jo jo Johannes would like to start, clearly. <laughs> I have an actual story on this because there would have been next Tuesday in Austria, in my country, uh, a meeting with ministry, uh, on a deposit on plastic bottles, yeah? 
but it was postponed because one of the workers in the minister's team yeah, was tested positively and so they had to cancel this meeting. So definitely, yes, COVID strikes also the sustainability discussion. Yeah? <laughs> but away with this, this, with this joking, yes, for sure, in the high season of COVID-19 crisis, uh, it, it was a little bit out of the headlines of the newspapers, uh, but the programs are there and the discussions is, are there and the and, the, and this, the direction of our thinking at the moment that we have go towards circular economy uh, and reduce our greenhouse gases and so on is there. And, and I don't see that, that it is killed by COVID-19 or something like this. Maybe it was a little bit step back, but, but, the, but the discussion is there. But I think people have also looked to packaging as a as a way to prevent COVID as well. I mean, absolutely, you know, that's true. Yeah, that's protection true. of product for sure. In the and back in certainly back in March and April, people were saying, "What can we do? What can we do with the packaging to ensure the product is safe, right? And ensure yeah. that we don't have, we don't transmit contamination of COVID through through food absolutely. products." Absolutely, that's absolutely true. Yeah. I think that uh, both Joe and, and Johannes are one hundred percent correct. There was a moment uh, in in the last four, five, six months where it did sort of take the back seat, but I think it's going to come back stronger than ever uh, in, in the coming months and into next year. Absolutely. Um, uh, and uh, I think there, there was, a, in, in one of the, the, the plastic packaging magazines, there was a, a cartoon uh, showing an image of, of uh, the guy uh, holding a, a picket with, with plastic on, on it, and, and uh, he, he was throwing mud and stones uh, on, on him uh, before February and after April he was throwing roses upon because of, of, of the positive effects He's of plastic. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and I, I, th I think this is, this is at, at the same time uh, a little bit grammatical and, but, but it's also fun, funny and from the packaging point of view I, I think it's, it's highlighting the positive effects of packaging and in that sense I, I find it very positive. Any, any more thoughts about this? Uh... No, fine. All good. Okay, then we have a, a, a following question. When, we market, uh, when, when the market is developing complex laminate replacement with PE stroke, allox stroke, adhesive stroke, ink stroke, PE laminates, considering recyclable solutions, how do you see the multiple cycle of recyclability and how the technical uh, bit in the in the real loop. So I think that question is is about multi-layer laminates and and their uh, fitness to, into uh, circular economy. Yeah, and of course we all know that with uh, multi-layer laminates, as I mentioned in the first part of my presentation, it's very complex and very difficult to to recycle. So again, you know, going back into why these laminated structures have been developed and each layer is there for a particular reason. You know, the outside layer is there for perhaps printing, the inside layer is to give you the barrier and then the, the inner layer is there for the sealability. So how do we get one type of material that's going to give the answer uh, in terms of a recyclable structure? So what's been happening is, is that people have moved more towards a, 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 mon a monomer type of material, a mono-based polyethylene type of material or laminate structures that are made from the same plastic family type, like polyethylene as an example, and also like polypropylene. What is quite interesting is if one looks at the family of polyethylene materials, generally speaking, polyethylene is very soft, so very soft, should I say, I beg your pardon, but has been re-engineered to give you very similar characteristics in terms of physical characteristics and mechanical characteristics that you would get out of a structured laminate that would con comprise of, like, let's say, a polyester or polyethylene. So what's happening is, first of all, we're ticking the box with regards to uh, getting a, a mono-based type of material to perform in the same way as a complex lamination would be from a mechanical point of view, and also getting it there with a barrier point of view as the, the, the question has come regarding an, an allox or even an EVOH. And what they're, what they're doing now is that by putting a very thin layer of EVOH or a coating in that particular example of aluminium oxide is that these materials are physically able to be recycled through monolayer recycling streams, providing the country or providing the infrastructure is in place to be able to recycle those materials. The big challenge we have, as we know, in, in Australia, as I said before, we don't have the ability to recycle soft plastics. And I hate to say that air materials are classified as soft plastics, but we've got some really great developments uh, that we're working on 
in Australia, whereby we've uh, we've we've worked exclusively with a with a company called um, with Roll and Recycle, whereby we're actually taking the packaging material, taking the pouch that's been made out of a monolayer based material like a polyethylene polyethylene with an EVOH. That pouch has been able to uh, go through the the full recycling stream. It, it's it, it'll uh, satisfy the requirements from a MRF, which is a mechanical re recycling facility, and then and then be separated and seen as a two-dimensional or three-dimensional pack. And, there, and how it actually works is the pouch, uh, the consumer rolls up the pouch and we have a label on the pouch, which is made from the same plastics. It goes into your recycle bin, then it goes through the mechanical recycling facility, and then it gets separated and then it's identified in the high density polyethylene stream or the polyethylene stream. So therefore being able to complete that circular loop and go back into mainstream packaging again. So there's, there's things that are happening. And I, I do believe different countries have obviously got different, uh, different rules and different trials on the go. So I think we need to watch this space because um, the sad part about it is that even if you look at what's happening in the UK or Europe, different regions have got different rules in terms of recyclability, uh, and certainly with regards to soft plastics. Soft plastics or pouches in their particular case seem to be the, the big challenge because uh, the, the end of use for those type of materials is very difficult. First of all, getting it to recycle, making sure it will go to the recycling stream, which is the big challenge. Of course, if everything was all made out of monolayer based type of plastic material, it'd be a lot easier because one could develop a mechanical recycling facility to take everything. But the big problem is that certain food products will still, will still need a complex structure, laminated material base to ensure it meets all those requirements. Absolutely. Yeah. Johannes, Pierre, would you like to add something? Well, I think in that question, you can be honest. Yeah. I think in the question, there is also a, a bigger question behind. Yeah, that means how often can we recycle these materials? Yeah, you know, Pierre, you agree with me. Just yesterday, we had this discussion between right recyclable and really recycled is a difference. Yeah, you can bring now on the market recyclable materials. That's nice, but if we don't recycle them it makes not that big sense, yeah? And then I think in my case, nobody is talking at the moment, how often can we really recycle it for the same purpose, yeah? And, you know, this is also, this is not only a plastic topic, yeah? It's also a paper topic and it's a glass topic, yeah? How often you can recycle paper that it's still that quality that you can use it in food packaging, yeah? Or in transport packaging. How often you can recycle glass, you know, glass, and I hope nobody is killing me now, but uh, glass is, 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 is good to recycle, yeah, but you know, we have these impurities in there, and if you look in reality, if you have some special qualities for pharmaceutical glass or something like this, or, or, or high quality spirits or something like this, you cannot use recycled glass because it's not meeting the, the purity uh, requirements. Yeah? And so there we are using fresh glass again. Yeah? And then it looks like glass and environmental friendly, but is it really like this? Yeah? And so I think for all this material, if we really go deep into the, in, into the discussion, uh, how long we can keep materials really into the inside the loop? Yeah? And what are we doing at the end again with the materials? Yeah? And there, I think now, especially in Europe, we are, we are burning many of the packaging materials using the energy out of this. This is not very popular at the moment, but at the end, even if we use the materials for longer time, at the end, I think will be the process of burning and energy, energy recovery. And if the materials are coming out of renewable resources, this should be not a big problem because it should be somehow CO2 neutral. Yeah? But so I think we also have to, now we are thinking in very, how we can make these structures recyclable. I think we should also get sight of the bigger circles we have, yeah? not losing them out of sight. I think just with that as well, in the ideal world, if we were able to separate the plastic materials and identify those plastic materials, one could actually sort of guarantee the amount of times you could actually physically recycle that plastic material. But the reality is, is so many different types of plastics, uh, so many different types of films and structures, okay? And the physical process to actually go through that re recycling process, could you think alone of the commercial, the commercial side of it, just the cost to just physically separate those type of plastics and ensure that you've got plastic A or plastic B or plastic C, that's gonna go into the recycle work. In the ideal world, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. But as you mentioned, 
we've got impurities. Okay, is the product being, has it been properly cleaned and, and so on and so forth. And the big question is that as a food manufacturer, and I'm sure there's food manufacturers out there today, are you happy to take recycled plastic back into the mainstream uh, to pack your food, even though we're going to give you a guarantee that it should be okay? There's certain, you know, there's certain aspects of, of leaching issues because of inks, because of adhesives, and because of mixed plastics, because of contamination. You know, the process alone to actually get that back into a semi, semi virgin process to ensure that it performs exactly the same way as a virgin plastic will is practically impossible. And what tends to happen when those plastic materials do end up back in the recycle stream, depending on what the end product is going to be, you, you can only look at using certain percentages of those plastics back in with a mixture of virgin plastics to ensure very important factors, mechanical performance, shelf life performance, shock performance, and, and packaging performance, machine performance, and so forth. I mean, we're, do, we're doing packaging with 40% recycled plastics at the moment for a range of customers. And we don't want to put, we can't afford to push the limits because we start affecting shelf life. We start, we start affecting some serious issues regarding sealability for liquids as a great example, you know? So one needs to be very, very careful. And, and, and you know, the other issue is commercialization of recycled plastic. It's all very well. I think you mentioned, uh, Johannes, is that, yes, we're ticking the box by saying it's recyclable. Okay. First of all, yes, we can look at using recycled plastics and that is a good thing. I think the great example is always the polyester bottle. We know that for, for drinking water and so forth and soft drinks. The second good example is your, is your milk jug, you know, your, your, your milk carton or not carton, but your milk jug, which is made of high density. They've got a very simple process to be able to identify those type of plastics. Mm -hmm. What do you think about, you know, the amount of plastic that's manufactured every day the films that are manufactured at, at eight and 10 meters wide, you know, five, six tons of plastic per hour made in high volume commercialization, okay, to, to meet the requirements of the packaging world, the flexible packaging world. Now you try and simulate that from a recycle perspective. Think of the volume, think of the infrastructure that you need to put in place to make something that's going to be commercially viable to compete with what a virgin material is going to be and give you the same performance. And hence what we see is that we see recycled plastics becoming more expensive because the physical, pro not because people want to make a margin, but the physical process to, to actually recycle that plastic is a lot more expensive than it is to make virgin plastic purely because of the scale, the commercialization of making those virgin plastics. Polyester is a great example. Polypropylene is a great example. Eight, 10 meters. Why do, why do film producers make polypropylene eight meters and 10 meters wide at five and 10 tons per hour because of commercialization, because they want a bigger slice of the market. They want to get the, the, the cheapest product, or not cheapest product, but certainly biggest volume out there. Now you try and think about a recycling plant that's going to have to separate all those individual plastics. That's the harsh reality of it. So we're saying, let's make it recyclable. Let's find an end use for those recycled plastics because we know certain countries around the world, and we see it happening in Australia. I've seen it recently in New Zealand, is the buildup of stacks of plastics, and I've seen it with glass as well, funny enough, that they haven't got an end use for, well, they have an end use for, but it's commercially not a viable structure at this, at this particular stage to move into a fully recycled stream. So we have lots of challenges, and, and again, it's, it's really working with governments, trying to get some incentives in place, working with industry to say, yes, we want to, the consumer to say, yes, we don't mind paying a little bit more because we know we've actually saved plastic from going to, to landfill by being able to look at using it again. But, but most importantly, getting back to that packaging hierarchy, we can't not uh, lose sight of the very, very important factors, food safety, if it is food, okay? Product requirement, shelf life requirement, machine efficiency, commercialization, shelf appeal, and so forth. These are very, very important factors. Very true, very true. Pierre, would you like to add something? Other than uh, taking a completely different tack, and, and it comes back to education, uh, we simply cannot continue to produce material that is not easily recyclable. If it's not easily recyclable, it will not be recycled. I must remind the viewers and the listeners uh, today to go and Google the Great Pacific Garbage Patch and get an idea of what, what disaster is looming ahead of us. And if one then takes the, uh, the other side of the coin, during this pandemic, we, we create these high barrier structures for what? To increase the shelf life. 
So we, are, we as consumers are putting the pressure on the converters to come up with these solutions. Whereby, if one looks at what happened in the pandemic, uh, when, um, when there were shutdowns and uh, there was a rush on the supermarkets, the items, the high moving items, yes, there were toilet rolls gone and stuff like this, but the high moving items were fruit and vegetables, not the high barrier structures for long life um, um, uh, foodstuffs. So what is that telling us? What is it, what is it, what are the consumers seeing uh, from their perspective what's important? And so it's just, uh, in my mind, the, 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 it, it's not easily solvable, but uh, it's a simplistic uh, situation that, uh, that we presented with. And that is that, do we require these high barriers for such a long uh, extension of shelf life of our foodstuffs? Or can we rather go back to some sort of simple, more simplistic, I wouldn't say it's too simple because our lifestyles are different than, they, than our parents or grandparents, but is it necessary? Can we not purchase, um, you know, those sort of foodstuffs every, maybe every two weeks? Do we need something that's a month, two months, six months? I don't think so. A good point of view. Okay. Um, we'll take the next, next question, which is coming actually from our friend Anthony Payton. Um, so Anthony is asking the panel, panelists that the uh, Australian government has recently announced that no recovered used packaging will be allowed to be exported in the coming years. Does the panel see this type of policy extending to other nations over time? In what circumstances is this policy impractical? And while, while, while you are now, now uh, thinking about your, your uh, answer, I have to add that the European Union is doing much, much the same thing, as we know both uh, Johannes and, and myself. But now, uh, who would like to kick off? I think Johannes must go first. Well, uh, but Andrew said it already. Yeah, I said we in, we in European in Europe had exactly that that uh, uh, discussion or the, that development because uh, we discovered yeah, that a lot of our plastic waste, also packaging waste, is going to Asia somewhere, and they are doing something with it. Yeah, and that this is maybe not the best solution. So mainly we have been forced by these countries. Yeah, in Asia because they stopped to importing that waste. <laughs> uh, and we have to think now what to do with this waste on our own. And this caused all these uh, discussions on, on, on plastic reduction, single use plastic directives and so on. We are at the moment uh, discussing in Europe. Yeah? So um, yes, for sure, it, it makes sense yeah? if it is doing such, such export bans, yeah? as, as soon as it helps to understand uh, to, clue, to close your loops there and not uh, playing uh, uh, false games in, in just hiding your waste somewhere around the world where you cannot see it. Yeah? Uh, but at the end, for sure, I think on the long time perspective, if in another country there is a better facility for recycling or whatever, why shouldn't we do it there or something like this? Yeah? So at the long time, for sure, there must be also an exchange of recycled materials and so on, if the system is really running in, in, in loops worldwide kind of this. I think, um, you know, the part of the question that uh, Anthony Payton there, is it impractical? And um, mm -hmm. I'd say at this moment, yes, but the nice thing about it, is that it's forcing us to find the option, to find the use for this recycled plastic. And that's, that's probably a good thing, you know, and I see, mm -hmm. yes, we've stopped, we've stopped the uh, exportation of, of recycled materials across the, across the globe. And we know what happened in China and why China said no to recycled plastics. I mean, China was the dumping ground. And sadly, yeah. not just a dumping ground of recycled plastic, but what transpired was they became the dumping ground of, of waste generally speaking, and, and plastic was just, was a cover up for what, for what was being put into, into these containers. So I think what's gonna happen is gonna force industries in, in certainly in Australia and New Zealand and around the world to find options for these, for these plastics materials because while these, uh, these stockpiles are building, uh, they get very noticed very easy because you can't hide plastic, as you said, you can't just put it around the corner and say it's gonna go away. It's, it's, it's there for a long time. Plastics generally will not decompose out in the sun. It'll take many, many years. So I think what's going to happen 
is that I think industry is gonna to have to get together and say, okay, fine, here's the real issue. How are we going to find an end use for this type of plastic? Whether it's gonna go into roads as an example, where it'll go into second life energy, as another example, as we know, that can actually be uh, a, a very, very good option. Or again, unfortunately, a more expensive option with this, with this plastic is actually to recycle the plastic in house and re, re, reformulate the, the, the waste plastic back into plastic itself. But be prepared that, the, that there would be an on-charge and it would actually cost more than what virgin plastics would, would, would actually cost. And who, at the end of the day, who's gonna pay for this? It's really the consumer, isn't it? You know, and, and again, it sort of goes to the question, you know, and certainly we, we haven't even touched on compostable and biodegradability, which is a whole different, different story. But, but that one there in itself is, in, certainly in our industry, you know, compostable films and so forth is three times more expensive than normal. And then with, with recyclable packaging that's been made out of recyclable material or recycled material and or recyclable material is costing that a little bit more. Than what your your current complex laminate structures are going to be. So who's going to pay for it? Unfortunately, the uh, the consumer. So the question to the consumer is that there's your option. Your option is you're going to buy this product. It's actually made out of recycled plastic. It's going to cost you maybe 10% more compared to the item there. And you'd like to think that most of the consumers will say, okay, I'm I'm doing my bit for the environment by paying by paying that. The question is going to be asked in countries that don't have that luxury to pay that a little bit more. Third world countries is a great example. That's not high in their agenda. You know, uh, recyclability and plastic waste is not really high. You know, day to day living is probably their most important factor. So I think, and from an Australian point of view, Anthony, I think it's forcing us to find a solution with this buildup of recycled plastics. Pierre, would you like to add something? I mean, the, the, the waste should never be dumped in the first place. Those who create it should, uh, should sort their own waste out. So uh, Joe's right, you know, um, I, I think um, maybe the more engineering, more science, more technology must come into play here to, to work maybe more on the biodegradability aspects and the compostable side of things so that we don't create, you know, they, they, we don't have these plastics that we have to find something to do with them. At the same time, I think that governments will now become more involved in packaging to try and find the solution to this problem. Yeah. Very true. Okay, so uh, we have, according to, to my clock, we have three minutes to go for this webinar. And I think that uh, it's time to, to take the last question, uh, which is actually uh, moving us to, towards the future. So it's uh, Pratamesh Patil from the audience who's asking also, how is smart and intelligent packaging helping sustainability initiatives taken by brand owners? And now I'd like to have uh, short answers from, from each one of you to wrap up the, the webinar. I'll go first. So the, uh, you know, the, the slide I put up on, the, on my presentation regarding the 2050 scenario, uh, if we continue on the same trajectory, and it's very real. Um, and, and there's no alternative solution. If we want to find a solution for our children and our grandchildren and those to follow, then we have to find the solution. Now, in terms of smart packaging, either active and intelligent packaging, uh, active packaging, I think the, uh, as I said earlier in my previous statement regarding technology, science and engineering, in, in uh, will become more uh, to the fore in trying to find a solution for sustainability. Um, but at the same time, I think we as consumers have to be more realistic on our demands on the converters in terms of shelf life uh, uh, scenarios. Um, from the intelligent side, uh, there's a lot of, there are a fair amount of detrimental intelligent uh, options that are coming onto the market because um, those that are indicating and communicating to the consumer that the shelf life is coming towards the second half of its shelf life, then we, we try, we, we're finding a situation where consumers are being dissuaded from purchasing that particular component or that particular uh, product. So I think that um, it the focus is going to be more on science, technology, and engineering 
in the smart packaging space. If we want to fulfill the 2050 scenario that I've, I've painted earlier on. Even earlier, we get, we're getting uh, the 2025 goals and the 2030 goals across the world. And um, if we want to meet those goals, then we need more government involvement, but we also need more understanding from the consumers, and that means education. And, and I think certainly that smart packaging or intelligent packaging is, I always say, is, is definitely the future within airspace, uh, within, within flexible packaging. Packaging, people are going to see the demand, and certainly because of the lifestyle that we have, they see the demand expecting more out of the packaging to protect the product and do more than just be a container in the just being a container and keeping the product fresh. I think what's going to happen as a result of the demand for more smarter, intelligent packaging is that sustainability will actually follow that route and sustainability will, will, will actually be relying on the advances towards what's happening in the smart and intelligent packaging uh, area. So we'll see ways to communicate better. So therefore, we can actually eliminate the amount of ink. We can see uh, we can see packaging that actually has a, a shorter shelf life, therefore in changing the specifications because we've actually communicated better to the, to the consumer. We see packaging that can actually be more robust and, and withstand more higher shock and transportation and so forth. And, uh, but again, by communicating that, by putting something additive into the package and making it more smarter and therefore contributing towards a more sustainable solution. But I think smart and intelligent packaging is going to be leading it and sustainability is going to be very relying on, on what the smart packaging and intelligent packaging is doing to solve the issue around sustainability. I know it's a bit of a weird way to answer it, but I think smart is the way to go. There's no doubt about it because I see, I see a great future in, in intelligent packaging across the whole, the whole spectrum of packaging itself. Thank you. Johannes, you have the last words. Not that much to add because I just can agree them both. Yeah, I think I also smart intelligent packaging, active intelligent packaging is 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 the future. Yeah, and I think the question is how smart intelligent packaging can 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 solve these needs we have for more environmental friendly packaging. Yeah, doing that communication not only on a brand communication but only how can we use this packaging environmental friendly and how can we recycle it and how can we sort it and how can we bring it into a loop? Yeah? On the other hand side, for sure, we must be careful that, that all this intelligence and this activity we have that in our bags is not again a problem in this loop thinking. So if you're working on smart intelligent packaging at the moment, don't forget about this sustainability circular economy because your smart package must fit into that idea, otherwise it will not be successful on the market. I think those were great last words <clears throat> from the panelists. So uh, <clears throat> we have used the time that we have uh, reserved for this webinar, I think very much the, the distinguished uh, panelists and speakers, and, and of course uh, the, the great audience that we have had. Uh, I think that the high num number of questions proves that uh, sustainability and packaging are an important topic that we will certainly return back to uh, with, with the means of, of WPO events and webinars. So thank you very much and uh, have a good day or evening or morning or whatever it is in, in your area of the world. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.